Hi, Assalamu Alaikum and good morning everyone. Thank you for visiting my channel again. Abdul Rahim here with you. So in the last vlog we started about valvular heart diseases and I described you a bit of about mitral regurgitation. Today I'm going to show you on the slides like what, how is the structure of the mitral valve, okay, like about the anatomy of the mitral valve. Then we will go into the uh, types of mitral regurgitation. I will explain you the types, okay, and then uh, and then I will try to show you the some examples of mitral regurgitation with their types as well. Okay, in the next vlog we will start doing the quantification. I will explain you about the quantification and I will try to show you as well like how do we apply these quantification in mitral regurgitation. Okay, so let's come on to the slides now and I will show you about the structure and the types of mitral regurgitation. So we are starting the presentation, we are starting with the definition. So I already explained you in the last vlog that any abnormal flow coming from the left ventricle to the left atrium from mitral valve in systole is called mitral regurgitation, leakage of blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium. Okay, so this is the definition. Then this is most important slide. I'm going to explain the mitral valve structure or mitral valve anatomy. Okay, so mitral valve is consists of mainly two leaflets, anterior and posterior leaflet. Anterior leaflet is bigger than the posterior leaflet then both the leaflets are attached to the annulus the anterior one is attached to anterior annulus and posterior one is attached to posterior annulus then the papillary muscles and cordytendinary papillary muscles are the muscles within the left ventricle there are two papillary muscles one is the anterolateral one and one is the posteromedial papillary muscle so these are the two papillary muscles so the cords are attached with these papillary muscles okay these are the cords and also with the mitral valve. So these cords helps mitral valve to open and close. For example, when the diastole starts, these uh, left ventricle starts dilating. So these walls start going backwards. Okay. So these papillary muscles gets go, goes back as well. And these cords get stretched with these papillary muscles. And also the leaflet of mitral valve gets stretched towards the apex. So that's the, that's the time when mitral valve opens up properly. And when the when the systole starts, the papillary muscle goes inside, okay, and these cords get loosened up, and the mitral valve closes properly. So that's how the cords help mitral valve to open and close. There are two commissures as well. One is anteromedial commissure, and one is the posterolateral commissure. We need to uh, uh, keep them in our mind. They help us, especially in mitral stenosis patients, okay. And now we will go into the detail of uh, anterior and posterior leaflet. So both the leaflets of mitral valve had some indentation and then we divide uh, these indentations to the scallops. We call them like uh, each the leaflet is consists of three scallops. A1, A2, A3 is the anterior leaflet. And once we talk about the posterior, posterior is P1, P2, P3. So these are the leaflet scallops. I will explain you in this picture. If you look at this picture, this picture explains us about the view, like which view we are going to see and also the which scallops we are going to see in that uh, particular view. Okay, let's start from parasternal long axis view. So parasternal long axis view, if you look at this chart, it tells us that we are going to see mainly A2, P2. Okay, we can see the other scallops as well in parasternal long axis, but I'll explain you later. At the moment, the standard parasternal long axis, you are going to see A2, P2. In uh, uh, apical four chamber view, if you look at this cut, this it goes this way. So we are going to see some part of A3, then A2, and then P1. So we are going to see A3, A2, and P1. And in, in uh, apical two chamber view, if you look at the cut, it goes this way. This is the cut, okay? So P1, A2, and P3. So we came to know that in the apical uh, two chamber view, on the two sides we are going to see p3 and p1 and in the middle we will see a2 uh, also one thing very important to keep in mind that they give this left atrial appendage here which is very important so whenever you are going to see left atrial appendage your a1 and p1 is going to be closer to left atrial appendage okay if this appendage moves here your a1 p1 will be here okay so this is a very good identification mark you need to keep in your mind because it will help you a lot once you will be working in the ORs or somewhere else. Okay, so let's come back to the presentation. I'll explain you the sorry. I'll 
I'll explain you the scallops again in detail in the views. So let's come here. This is the standard parasternal long axis view. So in parasternal long axis view, as I told you in the last picture, we are going to see A2, B2. But if you go more towards the aortic valve and you open the aorta slightly more and at that time your LV will start getting foreshortened. You see, your LV is getting foreshortened. Your aorta start opening up better. You will see A1, P1. Okay. And if you close the aortic valve and you start opening up your tricuspid valve, like for example, you are going towards your RV inflow view. Okay. But uh, once you start seeing this tricuspid leaflet here, it means your scallops change to A3, P3. So you see, it's the same image, the same view, but you are going to see almost three, uh, almost all the scallops there. So scallops are changing with your angle. So always keep this in your mind once you are going to report any scallops in transthoracic imaging, because you can have the other scallop coming, not the standard one, if your angle is changed. Okay, so just keep in mind. The next thing is the, the short axis view, you are going to see A1, P1, A2, P2 and A3, P3. Uh, keep in mind that in short axis aortic valve, our appendage was here. Our appendage appears here in short axis valve at aortic valve level. That's why this one A1, P1 is here. Okay. The next one is four chamber, as I told you before, you will see P1, A2 and A3 and two chamber, you are going to see P1, P3 on the sides and A2 in the middle. So this one I explained you already. Next, we came into the TOE views, okay? Uh, I will just go through quickly because I'm not an expert of TOE, but it's good for the learning of our fellows if they are in here. So once you are going to get the TOE view, uh, once you get the view and you see your aorta here, your LVOT is opening, your aorta is opening. So it means you are quite superior in your esophageal views, okay? So you are going to see A1, P1. Once you go slightly in, you will see A2, P2. And if you go slightly more in when your tricuspid valve and your uh, RV gets better, you will see A3, P3. This is all four chamber view, by the way, at zero degrees. So you just move to 60 degrees, which is your um, bicommissure view or the two chamber view, we call it. You are going to see the same thing, a, a P1, P3 and A2 in the middle. And then 120 to 140 will be your three chamber or apical long axis view. Okay, so you are going to see P2, A2 and in short axis you are going to see A1, A2, A3 and P1, P2, P3. This is your gastric view. Okay, so this is how you can assess the mitre valve commissure in detail in TOE. So then uh, 3D imaging, just I will, I will not go into the detail of 3D imaging, but just to tell you once you are working in the OR, there are two types of views in the OR. One is the surgeon's view, this is the surgeon view, and one is the sonographer view. This is the sonographer view. Once you are doing the echo, you will be seeing this view. So your aorta is here, your appendage is here, you are going to have A1, A2, A, P1, uh, A2, A1, A, P1, A2, P2, and A3, P3. Okay, so this is how you are going to get the view. Okay, and then once you will change it to surgical, surgical view means your aorta comes at 12 o'clock and your appendage comes around 10 o'clock. Okay. So that's the surgical view because most of the surgeons, when they will be doing something, they will ask you about the scallops or anything. So you need to tell them as per surgical view. So you need, this is how your surgical view looks like. This is your anterior commissure. This is your posterior commissure. This area is called commissure, okay? Anterior and posterior commissure. And this is your uh, leaflets, A1, P1 here, A2, P2, because our appendage is here. So, everything changed as per your angles okay your appendage came here so your a1 p1 here your appendage is here your a1 p1 is here okay just to keep this thing in mind that's why i told you that you need to keep this appendage as an identification mark in your mind okay next the role of echocardiography as i told you that it it tells you the etiology mechanism severity and impact of regurgitation okay so we are going into the classification of mitral regurgitation. I explained you in the last one as well. I'm just going through it quickly and I will show you quickly as well. So etiology, like uh, as I told you that uh, primary mitral regurgitation means that there is something wrong with the valve. When the valve is fine, but there is uh, regurgitation due to any 
a functional problem then we call it uh, functional regurgitation or secondary mitral regurgitation so in primary maximatus changes of mitral valve what could be the maximatus changes it could be prolapse flail ruptured or elongated cordy so these are all things which can come into the uh, maximatus changes then the next thing is degenerative changes for example with the age valve get calcified or thickening so this can also bring the mitral regurgitation infections for example endocarditis vegetations perforations aneurysm these things can also cause um, mitral regurgitation and that will also come into primary regurgitation then inflammatory diseases for example rheumatic valve you will see it a lot rheumatic mitral regurgitation is very very common so you need to keep uh, mostly the stenosis is more common but rheumatic heart disease especially rheumatic mitral valve you will see it more into developing countries okay so they can develop regurgitation as well so rheumatic mitral valve rheumatic and then collagen vascular disease radiation and different drugs can also cause um, marfan syndrome is one of the disease which can also cause connective tissue disorder they can also cause mitral regurgitation then in congenital patient uh, congenital uh, defects for example cleft mitral valve or parachute mitral valve okay so these are the different uh, uh, examples of primary mitral regurgitation then secondary will be ischemic etiology could be secondary to coronary artery disease especially to right coronary artery disease for example inferior wall mi the one i told you in the last uh, vlog and then annular dilatation especially in atrial fibrillation and restrictive cardiomyopathy so these are the main uh, you know uh, main thing which can cause mitral regurgitation causes and mechanism mainly i will tell you i will just summarize this all yeah. like if you are having a um, uh, for example um, uh, mitral valve prolapse so you are going to see the regurgitated jet opposite to your uh, to your uh, prolapsing scallops for example anterior leaflet is prolapsing so you will have a jet on the posterior side and if you are having a posterior leaflet prolapse so you will have an anterior directed jet when you are going to call a prolapse of mitral valve you are going to see the mitral leaflet going two millimeter into the left atrium okay just below the annulus line okay so you will just imaginary you will uh, draw an annulus line between the annulus anterior and posterior and you will see which scallop is going beyond this two millimeter more than uh, more than two millimeters so you are going to call it mitral valve prolapse and then we need try not to make the uh, mitral valve prolapse diagnosis in apical views because mitral is quite a quite of a saddle shaped valve so you might see some billowing there in those uh, uh, views so it's best to call it in uh, parasternal long axis image and uh, you know another thing is the rheumatic heart disease and mitral valve prolapse are more common causes of mitral regurgitation in young patients by the way prolapse is the most common cause i will tell you i will show you some of the videos so this is how your uh, prolapse looks like this is your uh, anterior leaflet this is the posterior leaflet and you see there is something here just uh, floating with the mitral posterior leaflet you see this this is not a vegetation if it's vegetation it will be moving both sides okay so it's just moving here so it means it's one of the scallop which is going downwards towards the left atrium so if you look at it in the next view you see it here this is again your uh, uh, apical long axis or you can say apical three chamber view and you see the same thing here in the next video you see this one uh, this is the uh, apical two chamber view and you see this is here looks like maybe some somewhere around p2 p3 segment okay but we are not very much um, sure about in transthoracic views so you see the jet is going a, a opposite direction so because your posterior and prolapse so jet will be going towards this side anteriorly okay uh, this is the, the uh, you know toe of the same uh, not toe sorry 3d imaging of the same patient so this is the uh, scallop which is prolapsing here okay this is ventricular side this is the atrial side so you see this scallop is prolapsing here okay and you see it here as well so this is how it looks like in 3d but we will read the 3d later on and uh, this is another patient just for your uh, interest this is a maximatus 
valve looks like maybe a Barlow's disease because if you see all the leaflets are prolapsing if you uh, stop it let me see if I can stop it yeah you see here this is over annulus and all the scallop is prolapsing okay all the leaflet looks like a uh, complete leaflet set prolapsing if you see all the views the leaflets are prolapsing and then there is quite much of regurgitation this is the 3d view of the same patient and you see both the leaflets are prolapsing you will see it how it looks like in 3d images this is my aortic valve okay the, my appendage is here this is my appendage so this is going to be a1 p1 a2 p2 and a3 p3 secondary mitral regurgitation so as i told you that secondary mitral regurgitation could be related to ischemic heart disease rca infarction or dilated cardiomyopathy tethering of leaflets towards the apex happen and that's the main reason and also the dilatation of annulus can play an important role as well in functional so this is the one you see this is one of the patient which is having uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction dilated left ventricle you see left ventricle is barely moving looks like dilated cardiomyopathy not an ischemic one EF is significantly reduced okay this is the apical four chamber this is the apical two chamber view so you need to you can do a biplane LVEF okay and then you can see this is the three chamber view and you can see the mitral regurgitation there is quite much mitral regurgitation happening because the leaflets are quite tethered if you look at the leaflet leaflets are quite tethered towards the apex in any view you see you see they are they are quite much tethered they are not coopting very well so we call it tethering of leaflets okay patients you will also get the, the tenting area and these things so this was the main thing uh, primary and uh, secondary mitral regurgitation and I told you like how you are going to do it in the next vlog I'm going to explain you how we are going to quantify mitral regurgitation okay so please stay tuned and uh, also ask your uh, friends to subscribe it and uh, please share your knowledge as well in the comments thank you bye bye